Well, welcome to the uh, first Gaudino Dialogue. I'm Edward Berger from the Department of Mathematics and Statistics and the current Gaudino Scholar. Robert Gaudino was a beloved professor of political science here at Williams College from 1955 until his untimely death in 1974. He was known for putting his students in uncomfortable situations and was a great proponent of experiential education. The Gaudino Fund, started by some of his loyal former students, supports the Scholars Projects, which for this year and next year, uh, we're going to be focusing on an endeavor that actually transcends all human activity, the uncomfortable act of being creative. This Gaudino Dialogue series will bring back to campus some of the most interesting and successful alums and have them share with us how they've been creative in their professional lives, as well as confess the uncomfortable but requisite failures they've experienced along the way. Tonight's event is sponsored by the Gaudino Fund and also uh, from the President's Office. I want to personally thank President Shapiro for his support on this project and also acknowledge the fine work of my colleague, Carrie Green, who worked behind the scenes to make this event a reality. Okay, well now let's get down to business and see if we can make our special guest uncomfortable. I'm already uncomfortable. I, I suppose it's possible that you've not been impacted by the incredible professional life of our guest, Faye Vincent. Um, it's, it's, it's possible, but that would mean that you would have never purchased a stock, never watched professional ba uh, baseball, never saw a motion picture, never watched Time Warner cable, and of course, never drank a Coke. <laughs> Otherwise, uh, you've definitely uh, been touched by this man. Uh, if I were to give you a complete a biography about Faye Vincent, we'd we'll be here all night, so here's the Reader's Digest version. He was born in Waterbury, Connecticut. He went to the Hotchkiss School and then graduated from Williams in... Oh, thank you, Hotchkiss <laughs> School, or 1960. I don't know what you're applauding. Uh, he graduated from Williams in 1960. He then went on to earn... Uh, thank you. <laughs> oh, thank you. I'm going to consider this a hostile audience now, just for the record. <laughs> Uh, he earned his law degree from Yale University three years later. Uh, from there, he practiced law in Washington, D.C., and served as an associate director at the Securities and Exchange Commission. From there, he became the president and CEO of Columbia Pictures and later was named executive vice president of the Coca-Cola Company. In 1989, he was named the eighth commissioner of baseball and held that post for four years, stepping down in 1992. He has served on numerous boards of directors, including Time Warner Incorporated, and has served as a member of the Board of Trustees on a long list of colleges and universities, including an, a, an incredible 18-year run uh, here at Williams College. Williams College? <laughs> <laughs> They're very fickle. Trustee? Uh, he's, been, he's been awarded uh, around uh, 10 honorary degrees from the most prestigious colleges and universities around the country. And in his spare time, he's also the author of three books, one which was just released. I have a copy of it right here. Um, we would have played for nothing. Baseball stars of the 1950s and 1960s talk about the game they loved, published uh, by Simon & Schuster just a, a few months ago. So as you can tell, he's kind of a slacker. But I decided to have him here anyway. Please welcome Faye Vincent. Faye. So the idea of this is just to have a free-form conversation, unscripted, we hadn't talked about this, and to, to hear about the interesting things you've done, especially the creative things you've done, and, and perhaps you can also share with us uh, failures of, of any size that you want and, uh, and just talk about your life a little bit. Now, as we were coming over here, you mentioned that you wanted to make it kind of an academic event, which is not, this is not designed to be, but you said there was something, there was something about your favorite philosopher you wanted to quote. Did you want to finish that well, story? Well, I've learned over the years that it, in an academic place like this, it's well to start with an academic figure. And I thought I might quote for you from America's leading philosopher, that is, the most prominent philosopher at work in the United States today is a man that we know by the name Larry Berra, but you know him as Yogi Berra. And the story is this. Um, a great friend of mine named Larry Doby died. I brought Larry Doby here to Williams some years ago. Some of you may remember. He was the first black player, African American, to play in the American League. And when he died, uh, a very substantial uh, service was held. And 
I went. And it was in a church in Patterson, New Jersey. And in the front pew, I got there with a fellow named Ralph Brank, an old pitcher. And in the pew, far over on the left in the front row was Phil Rizzuto. And next to him was the great philosopher, Lawrence Barra. And then I went in and sat next to Yogi. And Ralph came behind me. And so Ralph, as we sat down, leans across me and says to the great philosopher, Yog, it's really nice of you to come to Dobie's funeral. Now, the following sentence, I guarantee you, I heard, and you have not heard it, but this is Yogi at his absolute best. He leans across me, and he says to Ralph, Ralphie, I come to your funeral, so you go to mine. <laughs> now, could I make that up? <laughs> Greatest American philosopher, in your opinion. So, uh, Williams, you were here and graduated in 60. What was that like? You know, you were, were you a jock? Would you consider yourself a jock when you were back? Well, um, yes and no. I came here, surprisingly, uh, because uh, the football coach at Williams in my day named uh, Len Waters talked me into coming here. I, I came up here. I did not apply to Williams. And I came up here with a few other guys who played football. We had no intention of coming here. And Len Waters knew my father. My father was a very prominent Yale football player. And Waters said to me, down on Coalfield, I sort of pay respects to him periodically by going down there. He said, Faye, are you going to Yale? And I said, yes. He said, why are you doing that? And I said, well, because my father went there. He said, precisely. He said, you want to come here. He said, your father is getting better and bigger. The legend grows every day. You'll never catch up with him. Why don't you come here and be your own person? And I thought, oh, what about that? And then he said, aren't you smart? And I said, well, I guess. He said, you'll go to Yale as a graduate student. Come here, play for me. This is, you'll, be a smaller, you'll be in a smaller pond, you'll have more fun, and you can go to Yale to graduate school. Honest to God, that did it. I went over to the admissions office. Life was simpler. They said, oh, well, you have good grades. You're accepted. <laughs> is that, that really how, how it happened? Yeah. And I said, so I don't know whether I came to Williams because of football. I think I did. Um, and then I got hurt. We'll come to that. And I never played again. And, and I think Williams became, for me, much more of an academic institution. I, mean, I think the great thing about liberal arts is that coming to a place like this, you realize how important the life of the mind is. And for me to lose the ability to play sports, and it you was- were a, You were captain of the football team, right? I was, and it was a very important part of my life, but I lost it, and- So what happens, it's a legendary story that some people might know, but, but tell it to us. What happened? I live with three other football players on the top of Williams Hall. Uh, entry C, and we were on the very top floor, and we'd all played together. We had a great year, and in December, my roommate, Bill Mead, who's now deceased, but a good friend, uh, was fooling around, and he locked me in my room. He took the doorknob apart, and, uh, you know, the door opened in. There wasn't much you could do, and, of course, being 18 years old, I immediately went to bed and took a nap. And I woke up, uh, this was two in the afternoon, I woke up at about four and uh, had to go to the bathroom. And I thought, well, I'll, I can just swing out on the ledge and go in the room next to ours, mine. And I did that. So you would go out the window and, and you would kind of swing around and go into another room. Correct. Hoping the window would be open on the other side. Correct. And of course it was December, it was icy, I fell. And I broke my back. I hit a railing about two floors down. If you look on the back of Williams Hall, you'll see their balconies, little uh, steel uh, balconies about halfway. I hit one of those, mm -hmm. and it crushed my spine. Actually, Dr. Coughlin, his son is here, um, saved my life because they took me to North Adams Hospital. They didn't do anything. and. Um, a surgeon operated on me, and 
I, I had very bad damage to my spinal cord, and so. But do you remember that? I mean, when you when you actually fell, I mean, were you conscious? I mean, do you remember lying there? Did someone I'd, come and get you? I do don't you remember any of that? No, I, I thank God I don't remember. I don't remember anything except waking up in the hospital and being told that, and I was on a striker frame. I was paralyzed from my chest down, and so I couldn't move anything. And I woke up, and uh, I realized that I was in bad shape. This is now, your freshman year, December freshman, freshman year. year. Now that, you know, we talk about success and failure. That was a failure of judgment. I give a speech regularly in which I say I made some very bad uh, mistakes. And one of the huge mistakes was at 18 going out on that ledge. On the other hand, um, what it did was it changed me from somebody for whom football was very important to somebody for whom the life of the mind. I had no physical ability whatsoever. I couldn't walk very well. I couldn't run. And uh, I, in some sense, uh, it made me a much more dedicated and an active student. Um, I became very interested in all the other things that went on besides football. And uh, for Williams College, it seemed to me uh, I, I got a lot more out of it in one sense, though. Uh, the, the injury and, and the accident has affected me uh, for the rest of my life. I mean, there's not a day that goes by where I don't, I mean, just getting in here tonight uh, is a big burden. On the other hand, I made the mistake, and what we learn in life, I'm now 70, is that there's a certain ruthless sense of honesty about life, and that is when you make the mistake, you pay. What about in terms of empathy? I mean, it's hard to imagine your personality and, and who you would be if you didn't have that accident, of course. You can't kind of go back and, and replay the movie that way. But, I mean, do, do you think that you were more sensitive to people that either had problems or issues or were downtrodden? Do you think that affected kind of your mindset, how you looked at the world at all? I'm sure it did, although thinking back on it, it's hard to imagine what I was like uh, at 18. Uh, I mean, it's hard to remember the mindset. Big drinker? Uh, no, I didn't drink at all. I, would, I was, I, I had no money. I came here on financial aid. Indeed, Hank Flint, who was here, uh, helped me through Williams with very generous uh, support from the financial aid program. And I think without that and without Hank, um, life would have been very tough. My family didn't have any money, and it wasn't important to me. It was important to have enough to go to a place like this. But... I've always thought that those of us who came here on financial aid owe a special debt. Um, and I did some research, and the disappointing thing is that of those of us who came with financial aid, we generally don't give any more than the people who came here without financial aid. You would think that um, David Presky and I and others who uh, came here with help, certainly in my class, um, would be more generous, but on average, we're not. I don't know what that says. It's a little depressing to me. Well, or maybe they just didn't make any money. Maybe they stayed poor. <laughs> their whole, maybe the scholarship whole guys had to go out and make money. Okay, so, so you, you, what did you major in at Williams? History and French. History and French. Fred Rudolph um, okay. of the History Department. Yeah. Uh, did you have Fred? Was I he had, any good? I had Fred. Yes, he was very good. And I remember something I don't think anybody of my generation will remember but I, and that is I used to drive from here to New Haven regularly. And to go that route, you go through a little town called Litchfield, Connecticut. And one day in Fred's history course, he had a little 5% addendum that I, I think if you answered these five questions correctly, you would get some sort of jump in the grade from a B to a B plus or B plus to an A minus, I forget. But one of the questions was, where is the first law school in the United States located? And it's located in Litchfield, Connecticut. And as you go by it, there's a sign. When I'm driving from here to New Haven, as Fred did hundreds of times, he knew that the law school was there. Well, he gave that question. I got it right. <laughs> I've never forgotten it. That's so from Williams, you went to Yale which was not the oldest law school in the country. No, William & Mary, I think, is the oldest. Um, yeah, law what school. Was, yeah, was it fun? Was it good? No. Okay. Uh, <laughs> not good. 
not to put a fine point on it. Um, I think uh, coming from Williams in my day, I was spoiled. I went to Yale because I thought it was smaller than Harvard. I got accepted to Harvard and Yale. In those days, it was not that difficult. And I thought Yale would be smaller, and therefore, Yale would be somewhat like Williams. You go there, the faculty would be interested. It's, it's even smaller than Williams. And I went to Yale, and the faculty at Yale had no interest in me. They had an interest in the people who were the top 5% of the class, maybe. I was sort of among the unwashed. And uh, How low were you? Do you remember how low you were? I was low. Nice. Uh, <laughs> and uh, it really bothered me, because I'd come here. I thought, I've, uh, I thought I'd been a pretty good student here. I got to Yale, and I really didn't do very well at all. And I can remember being just bitterly disappointed. I thought, A, my life was over. I didn't know how I would succeed as a lawyer if I hadn't made the Yale Law Journal and been a very prominent member of my class. And of course, the great moment, the great insight occurred about 15 years out of law school. I got a call from the fellow who had been first in my class at Yale. And he had called me asking if I had a job for him at Columbia Pictures. Nice. <laughs> and I thought, I think I'm getting it now. Yeah. <laughs> um, he's a very bright guy, and he went on and did very good things. But I realized, but slowly and painfully, that there's much more to life than being first in one's class. I've always thought, what happens to all the people who finish second in their law school class? I've never heard of them. I mean, you hear about people over and over again who were first. I wonder what happens to people who finish third. Um, they obviously go on and do very distinguished things. So I did not have. If you're low enough, you can run for president. <laughs> turns out. I don't think second will do that. But. All right, so. You, are, are you talking about Ford? I'm, I'm talking about everybody, everybody. So, so you, you uh, finish your studies, your law studies. You practiced in D.C. for a while. And you no, did some, in New York. New York and, and then, then D.C. Washington, yeah. And, then, I, and you did some stuff with the SEC. That yeah, was, sounds. I did that. How, how do you make the transition from, from working as a lawyer, working on the Security and Exchange Commission, to, to taking over Columbia Pictures? That was kind of well, a, a jarring thing. How, how does one go from one career and then totally do something different? Yeah, now that was a, a jarring and difficult assignment. Herbert Allen, who will be here, he's going to do one of these moments more successfully than I, I assume. But you can ask him why he, he came to me and asked me to uh, run Columbia. I mean, I was a lawyer. I didn't even go to the movies. I didn't like the movies. Uh, I, was vet I was very interested in athletics and sports. I was not interested in the movies. And Herbert came. Columbia had a mess. There was some corruption. And I was at the SEC. In one sense, I was Mr. Clean. And when he hired me, uh, the whole impression that he was trying to cover up or not do what was right uh, went away, because the SEC um, was investigating Columbia. And by my going there, you couldn't have found a, a greater symbol that we want to get this straightened out than putting someone from, you know, you, you put the... And how long did it take you to straighten it out? Like, was it a three-year thing or a six-month thing? Or, I mean, what's the uh, timeline I, for taking I, it, a it problem took, company, turning around? It took a while. I mean, one of the things that um, I realized was I had to change the culture. The, the culture in the Columbia when I inherited it was uh, bad. People were chiseling. There was a lot of sort of penny any uh, corruption. And uh, I realized that, uh, and, and this is not my insight, but it is generally true, every once in a while you need a public execution. And I, I believe that I had to execute a few uh, people who were doing things that... So you went in there and you fired a bunch of people right out of the well, starting I did, block. I did, yes. And uh, I changed it. And uh, the thing that made me very proud, when I went to Columbia, this... <laughs> This will tell you about how well thought of I was. Um, a paper announced that I was the new uh, CEO of Columbia. Of course, everyone thought Herbert was crazy. Here I was coming from the SEC. 
Wall Street thought so well of me that the stock, uh, the day I was elected, was 22. The next day, it traded at 14. Uh, and I thought that was a particularly sad sort of commentary on what was coming. Um, the good news is that about two and a half years later, Herbert and I sold Columbia for $75 a share. Wow. And that was a very good uh, development for all the, all the guys on our team. It's a very, uh, I thought, funny story. There was a, a, a coach, a baseball coach with the Dodgers. Now, I leave Columbia and I go into baseball, another bizarre move. And I'm out uh, at Dodger Stadium, and uh, there was a, um, a coach, a third base coach or first base coach. And uh, he came over to me, and he said, oh, commissioner, he said, uh, I'm a big fan of yours. But he said, it has nothing to do with baseball. And I said, really? He said, no. He said, uh, the day you got elected, he said, or soon after, you got elected president of Columbia. I saw an article about you in the Los Angeles paper. They mentioned you and this guy, Alan, and he said, I'm an investor. And I thought to myself, you know, I think I'm going to buy some of that stock. He said, maybe those guys are going to do something smart. And he said, I bought a fair amount of Columbia stock. And he said, boy, he said, you made me very rich. And I thought, <laughs> And Tommy Lasorda was there, and he said, yeah, but what's he done for you recently? <laughs> <laughs> so uh, did you interact with celebrities? I mean, did you have friends that were like movie stars and things, being president? I mean, you must, you had that power to hire and fire people, right? You could well, yeah. make a Scarlet's career or fire? Yeah, uh, yeah overrated. I think that... Overrated? I, I, I think your statement is overrated. I... I I ran the company, the studio, which is where they made the movies, was in California. The trick was to get the right people in the right job doing the right thing. I never quite got the movie business to do as well as I would have liked. We never had, running Columbia, a really great movie executive. So we did fairly well. Uh, we could have done better. And yes, I dealt with, um, the movie stars, celebrities, if you will, largely because uh, they would come sort of making a state visit. They would come see me or I, in order to try to make them feel more comfortable, would go out and be sure that we had dinner. And so, yes, I... Uh, Who are some I, of the big stars that, that you remember that you had dinner with or wined and dined? Well, I Who are the ones that you didn't like? No, no. <laughs> Now, first, we'll go to the good people. I mean, all right, we, all right. Who did I really like? Um, Michael Douglas uh, was a good friend because I knew Kirk a little bit, his father. Um, Sidney Poitier is an old friend and directed a movie for us called Stir Crazy with Richard Pryor and Gene Wilder that did very well. Uh, you know, I, 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 in terms of people that I really enjoyed and spend time with. I don't think there were many uh, you, what you would call movie stars that I sort of hung around with. Um, Jane Fonda was a terrifically good person to work with. Um, Paul Newman was a real gentleman and a very elegant and classy guy. Um, one time we were flying somewhere and I was going to give Newman a ride and he and Redford were buddies and I knew them both. Now, the difference is Redford runs three hours late um, for breakfast. So that means if you have a date with Redford at noon, he will show up at 3 with no apology, just show up late. So when I first saw Newman, and, I, and we were going to get on a plane at noon or something, I was assuming that I'd sit there and wait for him for several hours. Right on time, he drives up in a little Toyota himself, no driver, no limousine, um, to this airport, drives right up to the plane, comes up, and I said to him, boy, am I impressed. And he said, why? And I said, you're on time. And he said, punctuality is the courtesy of kings, which is such a wonderful line. And I said, where did you get that? He said, I don't know. Look it up. Well, I did. <laughs> 
he's a very bright guy. It's a quote from Louis XIV. It is a spectacular quote because for, for Newman to be on time was the courtesy of a king. And I said to him, I couldn't resist, what about your buddy Newman? I mean, uh, Redford. He said, I have no effect on him. He's <laughs> hopeless. And that's true. Um, you know, some of those people, uh, there's no constraints on them if you think about it. There are no economic constraints, there are no social constraints. There's no such thing as immorality in their world. And, and they lead lives that, are, except for the criminal law, um, there's no barrier. I mean, there's nothing that keeps Robert Redford or Paul Newman or any of those people from doing anything. Right. And you, you, know, you can see that in the paper as you, as you read. And yet, a guy like Newman is a very decent Michael Douglas, very, and I tended, because I was such a, a suit, as they would call it, I was such a straight guy. You know, I came from the SEC. You can imagine a guy from the SEC going to a big Hollywood party. <laughs> I mean. He must have been fun. They were petrified. They, I, I know there was cocaine everywhere, but I never saw it because the minute I came in the front door, everybody thought, here comes the feds. And, uh, <laughs> you know, they would, uh, and, and I know because people told me the minute I left, everything changed. Um, I never saw cocaine in Hollywood, never. I saw people who had obviously taken cocaine. Uh, before you got, before you saw it, before they. Yeah, I mean, I, I remember. Oh, who? <laughs> I remember a well-known actor was coming to see me at eight in the morning and um, I spent time with him. You know, my antenna were not good. They're not good to this day. And he was, he behaved very oddly, but it was eight in the morning. And when he left, I said to somebody in the company, what was his problem? He said, Faye. He said, where have you been? He was totally stoned. Wow. He said he crossed Fifth Avenue at the height of the rush hour without waiting for the light to change. He said he almost got killed. And my antenna just didn't pick that up. And that actor was Charlton Heston. <laughs> <laughs> Is that right? My guess. I'll tell you a story about Charlton Heston. One day. <laughs> We had a uh, series of films nominated to be the Academy Award film. And Charlton Heston was to open the envelope. And we made a deal with him. I liked him. I, uh, we, I didn't know him well. But the deal was, Charlton, when you open the envelope, if it's our film, pull your ear. Because you know there's a delay between opening the envelope. So honest to God, I, I think it was Gandhi. He uh, was announcing the uh, film. He opened the envelope, and then it's sort of this totally grotesque gesture. He went, <laughs> <his photos here. laughs> Mr. Subtle. I thought that well, was. What were some of the big uh, uh, bombs that were made during your time at uh, Columbia? And there were many. Well, just give us some that we might have heard of. The legendary one is Ishtar. Oh, yeah. You were there for that? I was there. Nice. Now, the fun thing about Ishtar was. Making movies is such a difficult game. Here was a movie where Dustin Hoffman and Warren Beatty were going to be the two creative, uh, they were going to star in it. Every movie, that, and Warren was the producer. So you're a business person like me, and you look at history and you say, every movie that Warren Beatty up to then had produced had been a success. Bonnie and Clyde, Heaven Can Wait. Everyone had made big money. And every movie that Dustin had been in for Columbia had been a huge success. Uh, we did Kramer versus Kramer with Dustin, and we did Tootsie. Now comes Ishtar. And uh, so, you know, you say to yourself, these guys know what they're doing. They're very talented. Um, this is a reasonable bet, although it's a lot of money. And uh, I made the judgment that we would make Ishtar. The studio recommended it, but I said, you signed off on it. I signed off on it. And it was one of the legendary bombs of all time. It was, it's not that bad a movie, now I say that somewhat defensively, but. Uh, have you seen it? I have, many oh. times. I many times, really? Well, that's the punishment of being in the movie business. <laughs> you have to view. 
<laughs> you watched that. I mean, I saw Gandhi about 50 times, and I saw Ishtar about 25 times. Wow. Well, because you go to all these events. Yeah. So I went out to Hollywood a few years ago, and there I went to a party, and there was Dustin Hoffman and Warren Beatty, and I took both of them aside, and I said, look, I'm still mad at you two guys. And they said, why? I said, because of that goddamn Ishtar. I said, here's the trick. I know that when I die, my obituary is going to say that I had something to do with Ishtar. Now, <laughs> you guys made the goddamn movie, and, and when you die, it won't mention Ishtar at all. They're smart. And Warren Beatty said, you're right, and we owe you. What do you want to do? <laughs> we'll have a party. And I said, you'll have to come. And they said, we'll come. Yeah, we should have an Ishtar party. Well, I don't know about the Ishtar party, but the party <laughs> sounds good. So then you, you went on to Coca-Cola. And we was that a smooth transition, or how did that work? We sold Columbia to Coca-Cola for, as I told you, a very big price. And, and when Herbert comes, you'll have to ask him, but it was a complicated judgment. We were doing very well, but we thought that it was in the interest of shareholders to, to cash in. That is, to, I think it's a duty of management to sell if the price is so high that you couldn't get the price there within two or three years. Now, when we sold Columbia to Coke, Columbia was trading at $35 a share. Coke bid and offered us 75. Well, now we would, it would have taken us a long time to get Coke from 35 to 75. But what we didn't see and what made this uh, so spectacular, Coca Cola appreciated 3,600% in the 10 years after we sold Columbia to Coke. So although we thought we were doing very well, we picked a stock and a company that just went through the roof. And Herbert and I will say it's much better to be lucky than smart. Uh, we were totally uh, lucky. Nobody could have foreseen that. Coca-Cola is a great company. I learned a lot. You know, if you hang around um, long enough, and including places like this, you get the sense that corporations the word corporation is a pejorative term. Everyone is against the corporate world or the big companies or big oil. And you say to yourself, one of the things that we should be smarter about, I'm now lobbying you, the, lo the world's more complicated. Um, this is a big country. Uh, we have a very big government. Almost by definition, you're going to have very big companies. And if you're interested in full employment, and everyone is, including Nancy Pelosi, you have to have companies employ most of those people. The largest employer in many of these uh, states are some of these giant companies, though it's interesting. Do you know what the largest employer in the state of Ohio is? The Cleveland Clinic. The largest employer in Houston is MD Anderson Hospital. The medical services business in most big cities is the largest employer today. So talking about the loss of jobs in a place like Ohio, you forget that the medical world is where the jobs are growing in numbers if manufacturing is in trouble. I learned a lesson by being at Coca-Cola. I realized that a big company attracts some very good people. There are very bright, well-intentioned, good citizens living, living terrific lives, running some of those big companies. And, you know, the stereotype is big companies, big corruption. I mean, I came from the SEC. I saw some of it at its worst. But I think one of the things that we all owe it to ourselves to do is to draw fine distinctions. There are bad people in big companies. There are bad people in small companies. There are bad people in liberal arts colleges. I mean, the, the now, world. Why did you look at me when you said that? <laughs> I mean, you're looking right at me. And, uh, and I, don't, nice. I don't mean bad in an immoral sense. I, I, I mean Thank you. people who are improperly motivated or insensitive or That's greedy <laughs> or even modestly uh, immoral. But I think in, in the world as I 
went through it. I started as a lawyer, and I was very anti-corporate. And as I got older, I learned. Um, and Fred will agree with me. I was reading about the Rosenberg case the other day. When I was a liberal graduate here, and I was a young Democrat, there were three things that all liberals, and I was one, believed that were historically true. One was Alger Hiss was innocent. One was Sacco and Vanzetti had been railroaded. And one was that the Rosenbergs uh, were innocent. Now, 50 years have gone by, and I would say to a virtual certainty, the only question remaining is about Sacco and Vanzetti. It was just accepted that uh, Hiss could not have been a Soviet spy because Richard Nixon went after him. And he was Harvard and Harvard Law School and Covington and Burley and part of the establishment. We now know both Hiss and his brother were Soviet agents. And we heard the other day Morton Sobel say that he'd been spying with Julius. That issue's a dead issue. The only question is whether she was a spy and also uh, should have been executed. But my point is that some of the things that I accepted and believed were just sort of beyond argument almost have turned out to be um, wrong. So we have to really think through anything that we hear, whether it's in the media or people say, and we have to come to our own conclusions and we can't just accept the no, facts that other people report? And I think that's what education's all about. Mm -hmm. I mean, we read books and we know that some of what's in the books causes us to have doubts or questions about the book. Um, I've always thought that when I knew most about something that was the subject of the newspaper or magazines, and I really knew the subject, often what I was reading was very superficial and, and not uh, complete or even distorted. And you know, you, I mean, the advantage of being an old man is you now, ha I have seen so many examples of those things that I'm able to say to myself, who should be surprised? But at 18, I believed if it was in a paper or a magazine, that made it, you know, you, that gave you a, a real pause. You, you didn't lightly question what you read in the paper. All right, well, let's move ahead a little bit. I want to talk about your, your move back to athletics when you become the commissioner of baseball. So a lot of things were happening. That was kind of a tumultuous time, right? I mean, you took over, and then there was an earthquake right at the World Series, right? Well, right? the link was my friend Bart Giamatti. As Fred knows, my, my great friend was Bart Giamatti, who was the president of Yale and who died at age 50. We were, we were just beginning our time at Yale. He was a great man, a wonderful sense of humor, um, wit, uh, and he wrote some of the great things about baseball that have ever been written. If you want to read some really beautiful essays, uh, there aren't many, but you pick up almost anything Bart wrote and, uh, and, and you will like it. Here's my favorite Bart story. Um, he gets elected president of Yale and uh, people like Bill Buckley and all sorts of other savants are saying to him, um, What's your policy? What is your mission as president of Yale going to be? What are you going to do as the president of Yale? And Bart said, I had no idea. I mean, he'd been teaching English. Uh, he got elected president in a completely surprising development. So he said, one day I'm out in my garage uh, trying to polish my snow blower. Uh, and he said, I'm sitting on a tire um, and it's freezing cold and the goddamn snowblower won't start and I'm thinking about snowblower and meanwhile I'm getting ragged all that day by mail from all these Yaleys who want to know what my uh, policy for Yale is going to be and he said just there uh, sitting on the tire working on the snowblower it came to me and I rushed in and I wrote a statement uh, that I published the following Monday uh, and I said, I have now uh, come to the following conclusion, and I'm willing to state permanently, irre irre irrevocably, and openly that it shall be the policy of Yale from this day forward to do no evil and to try to do good. <laughs> uh, 
everybody recognized the folly of that silliness. So was that your philosophy when you were a commissioner? Well, uh, it was more complicated. Uh, the baseball commissioner's job is a particularly impossible one. You are elected by owners, and yet you are supposed to represent uh, the baseball community as a whole, the fans, the players, uh, and the owners. But because you're an employee of the owners, the union and the players treat you as one of them. And they will not, uh, in many areas, uh, obey or listen or pay much respect to anything you have to say. So on the one hand, it's a very politically difficult job. On the other hand, it's very visible. The number of issues, it complicated. People care about baseball with an enormous passion. And Bart and I went there thinking that we'd do it for a little while. I don't think we were silly. I don't think we thought we'd be there forever. But we thought we could make some, dip, some changes. One was in the issue of race. In our day, the issue of getting more blacks into management in baseball was important. We tried to work at that. A variety of other issues. I was happy to do it with Bart. I thought he would be the visible public figure, do all the speaking. He was a magnificent public speaker. When he had to speak and I was with him, he would say to me, uh, I got to go up there in a minute. He always called me Dep, as in deputy. And I called him Angelo. His real name was Angelo Bartlett Giamatti. And I said, I think I prefer Angelo. And of course, he preferred Bartlett. Um, and so I would say, Angelo, um, what do you mean? He'd say, well, using the piano analogy, he said, do you want me to go up there and give you just the melody, or do you want ruffles and flourishes and a lot of the right hand? And I would say, give me a lot of the right hand. And he would go up and start with Aeschylus and go through the Greeks, <laughs> quote Dante <laughs> at great length. <laughs> that was the ruffles and flourishes. I loved him. Um, I brought him up here once. Williams gave him an honorary degree. And uh, he spoke. Um, he was a magnificent person. And he made one, you, know, you talk about a mistake in life. He had one uh, mistake, and it cost him his life. He smoked five packs of cigarettes a day. And he knew that that was dangerous. But he, I think he always thought that he'd get a warning, and then he'd cut back or something. Well, he didn't get a warning. It killed him. He was 51 years old. And uh, people said, was it Pete Rose or all the other issues he had to deal with? It wasn't. It was five packs of cigarettes. That's under the heading of, excuse the Latin, of verbum sapiens, um, a word to the wise. So then you became, then you, you were named commissioner, right? Well, he died, and the question was, baseball was in a tough spot. Um, I don't think anybody really knew me very well. I don't think they had any illusions, but uh, they were heading into a labor confrontation. So um, they wanted me to do it. I, I knew that it was going to be difficult without Bart. Uh, he was a very good politician, um, and I knew I probably wasn't as good. It turned out I wasn't anywhere near as good. Um, and so I did it. And almost immediately, we had a big labor. Well, the first thing we had is an earthquake. I was commissioner about a month, and we go to the World Series, and uh, the earth starts shaking. I, I mean, you come from Williamstown or New Haven, you don't know much about earthquakes. And I'm standing in front of the, the commissioner's box, and I thought a squadron of bombers had flown over. It sounded just like 10 B-52s had flown over the ballpark. And I'd never been in an earthquake, and the noise of an earthquake is simply overwhelming. We dealt with that and a variety of other issues. So I had a tough run in baseball. I think luck plays a big part in life. I had bad luck in baseball. I've had good luck. What was the biggest lesson that you learned from that experience as a commissioner? Um, biggest life lesson? Yeah, you know, I, I failed. I mean, I, I tell people there are three great failures in my life. and. I think there are lessons for young people in them. One is I went out on the ledge, uh, which was a really stupid thing to do, and I paid for that uh, for the rest of my life, a mistake of judgment. 
a failure of performance. I didn't do as well at as Yale as I might have, and I didn't have the academic record I would have liked. It's a failure of performance. And then in baseball, I couldn't convince the owners that the union was, uh, they couldn't break the union. The owners thought that if they all got together and were very adamant, they could break the union and cause it to uh, crumble. And I couldn't persuade them. There I was right, substantively. I didn't have the skill to get them to avoid that confrontation. I quit. Uh, they then had a really major fight uh, with the, with the uh, union. The union won. Um, and the owners will never take the union on again. But I had to be the one uh, to sort of be sacrificed, if you will. Uh, and I, the, the life lesson is that there's some things you do, even if you think you are correct, um, you're, you're going to be uh, fired or pushed aside. Dean Acheson, you know, was fired by Roosevelt early on, and he wrote a line which says, there's nothing so noble and gratifying as to be fired for a reason you're convinced is correct. And Acheson then came back with Truman. But I, I read that and I thought, that's a very good insight. Sometimes uh, Acheson recognized you're going to get fired, and the question is why? I mean, what was the the reason. And as far as I'm concerned, it's an embarrassment. I would rather have left baseball on a high. I would rather have left it with everybody applauding gently and politely um, instead of booing. But the people, the Were you booed? Were you really booed? By the owners. But no, not by the public. The public, you know, having a problem with the owners in baseball is be like being insulted by Saddam Hussein. Um, <laughs> You can't lose. Are you, are you friends with George Steinbrenner? What's your story with him? I would say friend, no. No. Uh, He's a Williams alum. I'm aware of that. OK. Um, <laughs> Thought that might help. So we could bridge the. It didn't do much for him, and it didn't do much for me. Um, <laughs> you know, Steinbrenner is an interesting character. Some of you know him very well. Um, he has done some things here that are really extraordinarily noble. For example, Len Waters was the football coach, the man that talked me into coming here. He retired, had no money, lived in Florida, got Alzheimer's, and one day, long before I'd ever met George Steinberg, I was at Columbia Pictures, he called me, and he said, Faye, I don't know you, but you know and you like Len Waters. I said, yes. He said, I know and I like Len Waters, too. He's down in Florida, he's broke, he doesn't have any money. He and his wife, Amy, both have Alzheimer's. And he said, I want to collect some money from people like you and me to support him. If we get $100,000 a year, we can afford nurses around the clock, and the two of them can stay home until they die. He said, will you help? And I said, sure. He said, will you call your friend Herbie Allen? Now, Herbert Allen hates the name Herbie. And I used to say to him, I can tell whether someone's a friend of yours. If you don't know him but want to be thought of as knowing him, you may call him Herbie. If you call him Herbie, all of us who love him know you don't know him. Right, right. So George said, will you call your friend Herbie? I called Herbert. And uh, he get contributed. And every year, Steinbrenner would call me and say, Faye, it's that time of year. Could you send your check in? Will you call? Now, that, that is a very generous and good and endearing and noble thing. And one has to celebrate that uh, for George Steinbrenner. There are other things that I got involved with him on that are pretty ugly and distasteful. But the fun one was he gets in trouble with me, and I have a hearing, and he comes with his 400 lawyers. And I have him on the griddle um, because he's done some stupid things. And we have this hearing in which he's defending himself with all these lawyers. And in the middle of it, uh, he used 
the phrase, uh, no, I know what happened. In the middle of it, one of the people working with me accused George of doing something which my colleague said to George, George, you're being Machiavellian. And Steinbrenner says to me, Faye, I don't know what that means. You and I went to Williams. <laughs> now, my friend went to Yale. His name was Steve Greenberg. And Steve has never let me forget that Steinbrenner <laughs> thought it was sort of endemic for Williams people not to know what the term Machiavellian meant. This audience knows. Yeah. And I think George may know now. You learned. Well, that's great. Well, that's, yeah. that's all we're after, right? Yeah. It's educated. That's right. So that was a good thing. Okay, I, had, no. I had a cue line. I, I went to Joe DiMaggio's funeral, which is at St. Patrick's, and George was there sitting in front of me. And I said to him, look at her, a magnificent cathedral. I said to George, uh, trying to be a wise ass, I said, George, does this remind you of the Williams Chapel? And he was pretty good. He said to me, I don't know, Faye, I was never in the chapel. <laughs> there you go. Okay, we're running out of time here, so I want to ask Excellent. some very, very so yes and no questions. Just tell me what you think. So, so you, you spent some time you know, doing this, um, this you know, gig with baseball commissioner, and then you spent a lot of time doing academic things where you were on trustees, uh, board of trustees, and so forth. W which was more cantankerous, being on the board of trustees or, or the commissioner of baseball? Oh, there's no question. Baseball. Look, my experience. Short answer. No. Being a trustee. <laughs> Being a trustee, in my experience, never involved a cantankerous moment. Did you enjoy, did you enjoy that role? I mean, when Yes. You were, OK, good. All right, so now, how about a word? I know, because I know, you told me this a while back, that you actually are good friends with, with all the Bushes, right? Because you grew up with them, basically, right? Didn't you live with them or something? I did. Yeah. So t tell us very quickly. We only have a couple minutes left. Tell us, tell us a fun story about, about one of the Bushes. Um. Like, like George In this w. audience, that is a very big challenge. No, 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 they, they understand. These really, tell the story. In 1956, okay. just before I came to Williams, I went to Texas and I worked for an oil company that was run by George Herbert Walker Bush, Bush 1, or as they say, 41. And he was then 32 or 3 years old. He'd just come back from World War II. He had been shot down... Uh, he represented to me everything you could want in a young businessman, a great family. The President of the United States today was then nine years old. He was known affectionately as Georgie, and he was playing Little League Baseball. I lived in that house with Barbara and George that whole summer with my friend, and I came away with an enormous affection for Barbara and uh, for George Bush Sr. He's a gentleman of the highest order. I don't care what your political uh, feelings are. This is a classy, decent, uh, good guy. I've known him for 50 years, and uh, I, I defend him and think very well of him. Young George, um, as we say, 43, ended up in baseball with me. He was the controlling person of the Texas Rangers. And we would uh, work together. And every time I had trouble with him or he got a little obstreperous, I would say, George, you must remember that I'm one of the few who's seen you play Little League Baseball. <laughs> <laughs> he called you before he was thinking of running in, in 2000. Is that right? He did. and. Uh, it was a very interesting conversation. He would call me. He, he doesn't call anymore, and I, I don't consider myself a close friend. But in those days, he did call. And he, it was a very interesting conversation. He said, Faye, you know that uh, he, he was then governor of Texas City. You know they're talking about me running for president. And I said, yes. And he said, you know, my daughters are very negative about it. I'm worried about what will happen to them if I run. And... Uh, he said, I, I wonder what your advice would be. And I said to him, George, look, I've known you since you were nine years old. It, it, for you and for me, it has to be incredible that the stars have lined up and people want you to be president of the United States. I mean, isn't that astonishing? And he said, it really is. He said, it's incredible. 
And I said, think of yourself at 85. You're now retired. You're up in Kenny Bunkport, and you're looking out over the ocean, and you're looking back on your life. I think if you turn down this opportunity, you will regret it the rest of your life. After all, if you try it, you may fail. The odds on your being president cannot be high uh, just because it's difficult to get. But I said, if you turn it down, you'll never know. And I think at 85 in Kenny Bunkport, looking back on your life, you're likely to say, I really think that was crazy. I have to take a chance, even if I don't make it. It's the sort of thing that most human beings never get a chance to try. And since you have got this opportunity, how can you back away? And I think your daughters are just going to have to be dealt with. And I guess, and my guess is they will understand. I think if you turn it down because of them, it's a disservice to them. I mean, they don't get, it may turn out that they really would have been delighted to have you run. Now, the fact that he won, I mean, ran and won and makes the whole thing sort of bizarre. But I mean, imagine that here's a fellow that we all sort of grew up together, and here he is in a position to become uh, president of the United States. It was an incredible, uh, a, and, oh, and then he said to me, you know, I think that's good advice. I had the feeling that he'd already made his mind up before he called me that, that I was really confirming a decision that he'd previously made. But before I ask you the, the last question here, I just want to kind of put a little plug in. So um, our next Gaudino Dialogue is going to be Tuesday, October 21st at 8 o'clock. It's going to be uh, Janet Brown from the class of 73, one of the first females <coughs> excuse me, to graduate from Williams. She's the executive director of the Commission on Presidential Debates. So all the presidential debates, I think there's going to be three of them and one vice presidential debate that are coming up in the next few weeks. She's running the show for all of that. She's going to come in here the week after the last debate, which happens at Hofstra, and she's going to talk about creativity and leadership in D.C. So come out for that. Tuesday, November 11th, is going to be Herbert Allen, your buddy. We'll ask him about you. And then December 3rd, we're going to bring in a Deborah Rob Robinson, class of 78, who's a social activist out in California. So before I let you go, first of all, you were saying <coughs> for that you know people that were on financial aid, you were on financial aid here at Williams, and you were saying that you know, some people don't give as much. So you did all right. I mean, if you measure success by like money, you said you said yourself, you know, you made some money with with uh, Coca Cola and you made some money with uh, Columbia. So you did all right, and that must have been kind of a neat experience to go from financial aid to to this kind of success that you've enjoyed. It was announced, I guess, in March. Morty announced that you made a seven million dollar gift to Williams, specifically earmarked for uh, scholarships for financial aid. Well, and really to honor Hank Flynn, who's sitting here. Um, and I think he might have come even if I hadn't made the gift. Um. <laughs> when you look back at that journey from the beginning, you know, where you really needed resources to, to being a, a beneficiary to be able to offer future William students, you know, that, that kind of opportunity, uh, what goes through your head when you make a decision like that to, to make a very generous gift and for that cause? Well, I, I don't think money was ever that important to me. I don't think I set out with any specific intention of becoming uh, wealthy. I mean, I, I never expected to um, be financially successful. But I did think that there was an obligation of whatever dimension to be thankful to the places that had been so good to me. I mean, I went to Hotchkiss uh, on a scholarship. I came here. I went to Yale. Places have been remarkably good to me, and I, I mean, I think I had one of the great educations that was available in my generation. I don't think you could find three schools of higher quality. Certainly, you could find schools as good as Hotchkiss, Williams, and Yale, but you would have a tough time arguing that there were many places I could have done better. I think there's an obligation on the part of all of us to say thank you, and I think Williams is one of the places that made a huge difference to me. And I think Herbert will say that. And he certainly didn't come here on financial aid. One parting advice, life lesson, or something that you would want to pass on to the current Williams students that you wish you knew when you were here that, that would have been helpful as you look back now? 
You, you know, I think the lesson of life is to be skeptical about stereotypes. I think the trick is to recognize that in our culture, we are, there are a whole bunch of things that are ingrained into us in a variety of ways. We call them stereotypes, but I think the education and the benefit of being a reasonably intelligent person is to recognize that the stereotypes are often not accurate. And that goes for someone who came here like me, if you believe it, as a football player. Um, I'm almost embarrassed to say that um, I did that, but I love playing football. I don't regret coming here as a football player, but life is more complicated. And the stereotype of the football player is um, not as bright as the rest, um, you know, had to do a variety of things to get through. And I don't think that was true in my time, and I doubt it's true today. But I think stereotypes is, is, a, is a good way of suggesting to people that we have to be much more discriminating in our judgments. Keep an open mind. Well, skeptical. Faye, thanks. Thank you. Thank you.